All right, welcome in to the Odds and Audibles podcast. I'm Matt Prem, Eric Scopel on the show as always. And today it's our preview show. It's a week early, a day early, I should say. Uh, and we're bringing in Stephen Brooks of uh, Spartan Tailgate of 24-7 Sports on the show to preview this matchup between Oregon and Michigan. Uh, Stephen, we're just talking about it. Uh, you're coming out west for the game. It feels weird to call this a Big Ten game, but here we are. This, these are now two similar teams in the same conference how 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 has michigan state's season um kind of gone considering the expectations uh they had going into this year where like one ten win season since 2018 you know they had a fire head coach last season jonathan smith inherits a group that saw some transfers out saw some transfers in just mm-hmm. how are we judging this season and how is it defined as a success for Jonathan Smith in year one? Yeah, I think to this point, um, I'd say most folks, now it's, it's, you know, it's always dangerous painting with a broad brush, but I think most folks are pleasantly surprised. Um, you know, most people, look, the Vegas over-unders for win totals were like between four and a half or five and a half. So most people, I think you put him on true serum would have taken six and six. And I think that's really realistically where a lot of people were. He had a couple of people that were a little bit below that. A couple of people maybe thought seven or eight. I picked him to go five and seven, but that's about the range that we're talking. Like a lot of people at the end of the day would, would say, just get to a bowl game, get the direction, get the ship pointed back in the right direction and go from there. So in that respect, you know, three and one, um, I'm sorry, three and two, uh, you're you're halfway to, to bowl eligibility there, so I think that's been positive. I think they've just been, especially when they started three and zero, like they just sort of came out of the gate more cleaner and more competent than I think people imagine. And when you're talking about 61 new players on the roster that were not on the 2023 roster, uh, obviously new schemes on both sides of the ball. Um, you know, there's been a resilience to them in game that I think people have appreciated and, and respected defensively. I think they're a little bit ahead of schedule from what people might have expected. And, uh, you know, there's been some some highs and some thrilling moments and, and plenty of lows. But I think just in general, it hasn't been like the painful slog that a lot of people expected. There's been some fun moments like you go out and win at Maryland and a last second field goal. Um, and even within the Ohio State game, I think a lot of people come out of that on the outside encouraged. You know, that series has not been close at all uh, lately. And you look at the final score and it wasn't close again this year, but for Their first four drives went to the red zone, but they only ended up scoring seven points off those four drives. For a quote for uh, for two and for two full quarters, we'll say they they battled Ohio State as well as they have as a program in a long time. So there was a lot of confidence, I think, coming out of that. Let's go back just to to Jonathan because I think for Oregon fans, this is somebody they've known since he was a player in college, battling Joey Harrington in the Civil War for the Beavers, and obviously as the head coach at Oregon State and. What what when this job opened when Mel was let go? What what kind of made Jonathan the right fit? And I guess what was in the initial reaction? You kind of just covered sort of the assessment of the season, but like maybe what was kind of the reaction directly after his his hiring? Yeah, I don't think they intentionally said like let's go the opposite way from Mel Tucker on everything, but in some ways they ended up there, right? And you know, subconsciously or consciously, whatever, but. That's kind of where they had, I mean, Mel Tucker was very much about flash and self-promotion and promoting the program. Jonathan Smith doesn't want anything to do with that stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, Like he was about recruiting nationally and taking big swings and trying to get four and five star players. Jonathan Smith wants to get guys here for four and five years and develop them that way. Um, Defensive guy, offensive guy, you know, uh, Cleveland, Midwest, Big Ten sort of guy, West Coast guy. So they're they're very, very different in a lot of ways Um, in terms of what, so I think some of that stuff was attractive. You know, I mean, him and Mike Elko pretty much bubbled up to the top as the two best, like, gettable coaches, you'd say, in that um, in that cycle last year. Now, there's always some, you know, like Brian Kelly. Was he gettable when he went to LSU? He, nobody thought so, but he ended up being. But in terms of the, the coaches that look right for the picking, it was Jonathan Smith and Mike Elko. Um, and I just think uh, there's a lot of DNA that we've already seen in, what, about 10 and 11 months. Um, that reminds folks of Mark Antonio, you know, who's oh. obviously the all-time wins leader here. He, they're they're not the same person, but there's some traits and similarities that you can see Smith as sort of a younger, offensive-oriented Mark Antonio in some ways. I think that was attractive. So people saw what he did at Oregon State, and they see the parallels, like Michigan to Michigan State, Oregon to Oregon State. 
the dynamic there that's in play where you have, you know, lesser resources, lesser spotlight, all that stuff. Talk about building a program over time in several years, developmental players, turning guys that, you know, just kind of go, yeah, you go yeah, on signing day, turning them into NFL guys or at least really good college players. That was Mark Antonio's M.O. So they saw some of that and were like, OK, we can get on board with that. He's also a proven head coach that Mel Tucker wasn't. You know, he does have a track record as a head coach. Uh, Mark Antonio had a little bit of that as well. Not as much success probably on the high end as Smith when he came in. So there, there was that that people got on board with. But they just, again, by the end of the Mel Tucker deal, for a lot of reasons, people just want anything different. And John Smith was different in a lot of different ways. So I think they were very eager to wrap their arms around it. A common trait with Jonathan Smith teams at Oregon State where they were built around a, a really good run game and then a front seven defensively that had some studs at linebacker. Um, is that kind of his blueprint for what he envisions Michigan State looking like? And I guess how close to that are they right now? Definitely offensively, you see the same stuff. I mean, he did bring over his offensive coordinator, Brian Lindgren. He brought over six assistants in total that were at Oregon State. Uh, you definitely see that, and that's part of their problem right now. And you know, as we'll get into, like they cannot run the ball the way that they were accustomed to at Oregon State. Um, the offensive line as a program at Michigan State has really been a problem, pretty much every year since 2018. Maybe save for 2021, but they had Kenneth Walker, and he was able to mask some things a little bit. I still don't even think that was a great group. And that one NFL guy on that line, he was the second to last pick in the draft, AJR Curry. So. Um, they'll have to say O-line play has been a real problem around here for a long time. And we all know you can't just snap your fingers and microwave that position. That's probably the longest position it takes to do a real rebuild. So Mel Tucker and those guys, I give them credit there. They did bring the size back up in that room and they recruited some pretty good players that just, just now are entering years like three and four and five that you want to see performance. Um, but it just hasn't come together yet. Now they've had some injuries as well. They did lose some key guys, two starters to the portal. Uh, two other starters just graduated. So it was a dicey deal to begin with, and it just hasn't come together yet. And they, so long story short, they just cannot run the ball. And it, as you guys, I'm sure, are familiar with, like, that was so vital to what every offense, of course. But all the play action, bootleg stuff that they were doing the last few years, like, that's not really on the table for them right now because they just can't run the ball at a serviceable level. I know their numbers might look okay, but trust me when I tell you, like, down to down, there's very little confidence that they can block like basic run plays. So the counter of that, I guess, is is what's there in the pass game. And um, Aiden Childs, again, going to be a lot of familiarity between these teams, by the way, which is kind of unusual considering, again, and they're in the same conference now, but they have a, quite a bit of geography between them. Um, but Aiden's a guy Oregon recruited in, at a high school, and obviously he played against him a year ago where he played a little bit for the Beavers. We are aware of the physical tr the tools. This guy has an absolute cannon for an arm. He's a really good athlete. I think there's no doubt that there's NFL traits there. What, what have you seen so far in terms of just the rest of it? Because from the outside in, looking at the numbers, the first number you see is the interceptions, which is a really large yeah. number through four games or four or five games. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's uh, I'm glad I don't have to explain like the first part that you just laid out there because like you just look at it, you're like this guy's trash, you know, or whatever, just, he's average at best, but like he, he's shown some extremely high level stuff. So um, it's been consistency, you know, as boring or basic as that might be. It's, it's very much consistent. It's one throw, your jaws on the floor and then the next, you know, you want to hide under the pillow like, oh, my God, how did you do that? Like, why would you do that? You know, it's it's every play is a roller coaster. Um every game, you know? So I, I think the biggest thing is, you know, there was a lot of hype behind him when he came here um, for a lot of reasons. You know, he did play the nine games last year, was able to showcase things. So I think for nine months or so, once he got here in January, it was Aiden Child. You know, like I said, Jonathan Smith doesn't seek the spotlight or the headlines, doesn't do a lot of interviews other than, you know, your, your routine stuff. Aiden Childs was like the face of this new era from day one, basically. Uh, everyone knows He's being paid handsomely. That he's got a lot of talent. So I just think he came right out of the gates this season, trying to be the man right away. And I mean, his first pick of the first first pass of the year was picked off. Now it was kind of a tough play. It was bobbled on the sidelines by the receiver and got kind of plucked it out of the air. But regardless, uh, multiple picks in that game, multiple picks in um, three of his first four games. Would have had a pick in all four of his first four games if not for offsetting penalties. So I just think he's been too. Uh, wound up upstairs. I think he's been too cranked up, trying to be the guy right away, trying to be the stud 
that everyone's made him out to be right away. And so he's forced things, um, made some bad decisions, you know, and the turnovers have probably been the biggest problem. It's whether it, whether that's forcing things, whether that's just misreading things. A couple of them have just been tip your hat type of good plays. Um, but, yeah, I think that's mostly what his issue has been because when he's calm and when things are right and he can just deliver the ball, like, it's a work of art. It's beautiful stuff. Or to see him escape the pocket and extend stuff, like, the guy is incredibly talented. But I do think he's tried to do a little too much, and that has been um, – probably a big part of his consistency issue so far yeah you guys don't need to sell me on him he was one of my favorite and it's the same class as Dante Moore who obviously ended up at Oregon and Austin Novosad who did as well but Childs was somebody that I think a lot of people out west were, were really fired up about and, and kind of surprised he ended up at Oregon State but obviously it's worked out for him now that he's in East Lansing um again a lot of familiarity here I wanted to get something that maybe is a little different which is like maybe schematically what Michigan State does defensively. Trent Bray did not join him, obviously. He's Oregon State's head coach. And it sounds like, based on what Coach Landing said on Monday night, that maybe the defense doesn't resemble entirely what Jonathan's done in the past. Can you give us a sense of kind of what they're doing and then maybe some of the strengths of that defense? Sure. So he brought... to be that so his system is a uh, it's a 4-3 base they will run a lot of nickel um, but with the 4-3 they run a stand-up end um, toward the boundary they just call it a rush end they don't call it like a monster or a hero or whatever you know they don't have any cool name for it just a rush end but it's like a hybrid linebacker defensive end you know the guy will drop into coverage he'll rush the passer he'll set the edge he's, he's got to do everything that's the biggest difference um, probably in just in terms of how they line up and whatnot you got that stand-up guy but again they will play a lot of nickel on the back end, um, they play everything. You know, last like I was so used to the previous staff, they were kind of like cover three or die, you know, and if they did anything else, it was it was a major wrinkle. They play everything in the back end, um, and they, they do a pretty good job of disguising it. Rossi does like to blitz Nick, uh, DBs, we've learned. And I don't know if that'll always be a thing or, if we, you know, they don't, they're not great pass rushers in the front seven, so maybe he just feels he has to generate it that way. But a nickel blitz, a corner blitz, Safety blitz, he'll, he'll throw that stuff in there. Um, so, like, structurally-wise, that's what it is. You'll get, you'll get too high, you'll get single high, all sorts of coverage. And then um, the biggest thing, the best thing that they've done early is, uh, I guess, two things. They have been resilient. You know, in-game, they face some stuff and have bowed up and, and responded. You know, they're a very mentally strong group, I would say, which I think is a credit to, to all these guys in the coaching offices. Like, when you have – Two thirds of your roster, or whatever, to 40, 50 percent of your roster is new, um, and, you, and especially on defense, they're playing a lot of guys in this new system. So they picked it up quickly. They trust a lot of guys quickly, and they're all playing at a pretty high level. But there's a response to them. I don't. I won't go super in the weeds, but several games they've had like in-game adversity, not just sudden change stuff, and had to respond to it. And they have pretty much every time. Um, say for Ohio State maybe when that one just got away from them. So they're resilient in that sense, but also the run defense has been way better than I thought. Uh, Derek Harmon is now on the Ducks roster, and him and Simeon Barrow were going to be their starting D tackles. To me, definite all-conference caliber type of guys, probably NFL type of guys. You lose two of them in the middle of your defense, I thought that was going to be a problem. And I didn't really even see a starting level guy behind them to replace them. The guys that they had left, I said, okay, those will be good backups and, you know, guys four, five, six maybe. You don't want either of them being one or two, though, and I was wrong. They've been pretty good there, and they're good. Their strength is their numbers in their D-line. There's not probably – there's probably not a draft pick among them right now, um, probably not even an all-league guy among them maybe right now, but the numbers. And multiple of these D-linemen have talked about it as the season's gone on. They feel so much more fresh in the fourth quarter than they're used to because they're rolling in numbers – at a great pace and lowering those snap counts, you know, to the thirties and twenties, not the forties and fifties. Um, so that's really the strength. And then again, they've been good against the run front seven has a lot to do with that. The linebackers are veteran. They play four pretty consistently and they're all older dudes. So between that and the numbers they have on the D line, they've, they've been really good against the run better than I thought they would. And Ohio state was really the first team to test them in the passing game and it went okay. You know, I think there's still a little bit more for us to learn there though. Yeah, you kind of touched on the defensive line there for a second. I was going to ask you about, you know, Dan Landing brought up how they're sound, they're athletic. Um, 
sounds like there's a lot of them. Who are the names to know then, like the, defensively in general, um, that, that really stood out to you through, through five games? Sure. Chris Bogle is the starter at that rush end position I mentioned, that hybrid stand-up deal. So he's a guy that will have the opportunity to affect the game a lot of different ways because, like I said, he will even drop back into coverage. He's probably their best pass rusher, but pretty inconsistent. They just don't have a guy where you're like, third and long, where's he at? Where's he at? I have to find him right now type of thing, or I have to set my protections just based off this. There's not a guy like that. Um so it's more of a team rush thing. And again, they will send pressure to supplement. Um, he's one. Uh, Daquan Daus is probably their best D tackle now that Barrow and Harmon are gone. He's a transfer from Georgia Tech. Um, he'll make some plays, but again, they roll guys in there so often. Ben Roberts, who was at Oregon, is basically a second string guy, but he'll play a lot. Uh, at the second level, Jordan Turner, a first year transfer from Wisconsin, uh, was a Michigan kid who came home, was honorable mention all Big Ten one year two years ago um, at Wisconsin. And uh, he's kind of your classic, like, Big Ten linebacker, like, you know, bulky downhill type of guy. But he's just made a lot of different plays. He's had a couple turnovers that have been really timely and key for them. Um, He's a leader. He's a captain as a guy who's been here for 10 months. Um, He's a guy to know there. Uh, All the linebackers will play a lot, but he's probably the main one you're going to want to know. The D lineman, again, there's a lot of guys there. But I feel like I main, not main, named some of the some main ones. Jalen Thompson's their other strong side end. He's a good player, but it's just been kind of quiet this year. And then in the back end, I'd mention uh, Charles Brantley. He's a cornerback number zero. Um, PFF has had him as one of the gr- highest graded corners in the country. If you if you subscribe to that uh, theory and whatnot, uh, whatever they have going on over there, they like him a lot. But he has been he has been pretty good. Now he's very slight, but he's very experienced. He's been basically been playing since his true freshman year. Um, but he's he's not even 170 pounds soaking wet. You know, he's just very small, but he is instinctual. He will hit very hard. You'd never know you got hit by a guy who's like 165 or whatever he is. He hits like he's like 20, 30 pounds heavier. A uh, little bit of a gambler, but pretty good in coverage. So he, he's been their best guy at, um, at corner uh, so far this year. Matt, were you going to go or am I going to jump in here with another? I'll go for it. Okay. Um, I, I was curious. I, I always think, you know, obviously 3-0 and starts great, but you lo- you're learning a lot typically from the losses, and at least that's kind of been my perspective. What what were the takeaways there in terms of, like, maybe some of the, the things, like are there systemic problems, are there things that are, are going to improve? And then I guess what did you learn maybe about some growth potential in terms of, like, areas that they can get better at from those games? That's a great question. Um so yeah, early through the three and zero start, the still the the run game and the O line, like just you could tell that was going to be an issue. I knew it was going to be an issue coming into the season. Again, that's been a systemic problem for the program, and I didn't really like the personnel that they had coming back. I didn't think they addressed it well enough in the portal. I thought that'd be a concern, and it has been. I mean, you can look at them; they rushed for a hundred something against Florida Atlantic. They rushed for a uh, hundred something, I think, at Maryland, but it was never like one hundred thirty at Maryland. I'm looking here, like. It was never. It was a couple. Basically, it was it was really carried by a couple big hitters, and really even on this season, you know, we're still probably talking about like ten to twelve carries that are really juicing that thing up. It's a lot of negative zero, one, two yard gains. It's not that healthy, three, four, five, you know, uh, type of thing per pop. It's just they can block it up. I mean, we've seen some good stuff. Like they can block it up and get it all right, but it's just extremely inconsistent. And now, the last game they had two true freshmen rotating at left tackle. Um, I do think the regular left tackle will be back this week. Redshirt freshman Stan Ramil. He was a four-star guy. He's a good-looking player, just young. Um, on the flip side of that, the O-line has been good in protection. I do want to give them the credit there. They, they don't give up a lot of sacks. They create a lot of clean, clean pockets. But in the run game, it just hasn't it hasn't found traction. So even when they started 3-0, and you knew that would be an issue uh, at some point. Penalties were in the double digits in each of the first three games. They've been able to clean that up. But the turnovers have also been a common thread, whether it's Aiden Childs, whether it's other guys putting the ball on the deck. So you knew like a BC and Oregon or Ohio State, like they're going to have to play clean, first of all, to even have a chance. And they didn't do that really in either spot. They definitely still had a chance to beat Boston College. They were driving in the final minute and Childs threw another interception you know, on that drive. Uh, I think that was a second or third turnover at that point of the night. So that, that part has been consistent. Um, I think the receivers are – Okay. Um, they got a freshman, Nick Marsh, you know, who I'm sure folks will be aware of this week. He's probably their most, he's definitely their most talented. I don't know if he's like their 
best or most consistent yet. Uh, he went off against Maryland for like 194 and a touchdown. Um, big bodied guy, moves pretty well, 6'3", um, big frame type of player that can go get it on the outside. I think there's definitely a lot more for him. And just some of these other receivers as a whole, I think once them and Childs get better chemistry. Uh, tight end play I don't think has been as productive as we all thought, given what they did at Oregon State and bringing Jack Felling over. He's had a kind of a quiet start, so I think there's a growth potential there. And then I would say uh, in the back end, they're still just secondary-wise, they're still just a little untested. You know, Ohio State um, – Got a couple on them for sure, as they do. But uh, it was probably the it was the best passing game they've seen, and it was just one you know it was just one outing for it. Other than that, they haven't really been challenged by a lot of good quarterbacks or good passing games. So I think there's more back there maybe for us to learn. But yeah, like when you look at that start, you knew some things were still going to be issues, and the run game is the biggest one I would say for sure because they just they don't they haven't shown the ability to run it on anybody of substance. What's the injury report looking like for Michigan State? You know, Oregon going into this one, there was some concern maybe with their starting tight end. He got his bell rung against UCLA. He seems to be fine. A couple guys were missing from practice today, but they aren't starters or you know they're, they're rotation pieces. But um, what's what's the the Michigan State side of things? Are they coming into this one healthy with everything they've got available, or are they dealing with some stuff? They're def- they've been dealing with some stuff since game one, so. Um, they lost the, basically their, their entire second string, their two backup safeties are both out long-term. They won't be back for this game. Basically their number three corner is still out. He probably won't be back for this game. Um, let me think here. Like I said, the left tackle last week, they're down their top two right guards. I'll start there. Uh, so then they're starting left tackle. They moved into right guard is the third option there. And then they had the backup left tackle playing left tackle. He missed last week. So they had two true freshmen rotating at that spot, but. Smith said yesterday um, that that he was that the kid Stan Ramil, the regular, well, sort of regular left starter, left tackle starter, was back in practice. So I think he'll be back. Um, trying to think what else. I got Nick Marsh, the receiver I just mentioned, just came back in the Ohio State game, but he was very limited. So I, I think he'll be closer to full go this week. He missed the week before that. Uh, he missed the Boston College game, but um, he was a game time decision against Ohio State. They played him on a sort of a snap count. Didn't we didn't see a ton of him, uh, but I expect him to be full go there. They were down uh, one of their top three tight ends last week, Michael Masunas. Uh, he's their best blocker at the position, so he gets a lot of reps just based off that. Kind of sneaky good pass catcher, but that's not his forte. Uh, he was out last week. I don't know his status. Uh, da, 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 da. And then defensively, I, like I mentioned, the, the two safeties in the corner. That, I think, is it? There's been a lot, so I'm trying to jog yeah. it <laughs> It's tough to hand, hand, remember it all when it gets yeah. to four or five, six, seven guys, and it sounds like that's kind of what they're dealing with. Yeah, the main thing is safety depth, I guess, just as some top-line takeaways, and uh, offensive line has, has been an issue, and it's caused them to reshuffle some things. And then I guess just what's kind of like some some real keys for, for offense defensively, offensively and defensively, excuse me, just like – is there one thing like, hey, like, they know they can do this. This has to happen uh, for them to have a chance in this game. Offensively, it would be turnovers. You know, that's, they've just been such a constant, and sometimes they've gotten away with them, sometimes they haven't. Oregon, especially on the road, is not going to be a team you're going to be able to get away with that. Um, so, like, if, if they just hold on to the ball, they have shown some flashes of potential. They can run the ball enough to to keep a semblance of balance not to really be productive and feel like they're rolling but just enough maybe at times they can do that and when Childs uh, is comfortable when he's not running at 100 miles an hour between the ears he can settle in and make those throws and make those plays I mean he's missed some gimme sometimes just because he's out of whack up top I think um, but if they can just hold on to the ball give themselves every opportunity to maximize a possession I do think they could maximize some if they start giving it away then then they have no shot. I mean, you look at last week, They, like I said, the first four drives all ended in the red zone, and uh, only one of them resulted in points. Like, they can't do that again. If you get to the red zone four times, you better come away with four, four scores of some kind. Um, defensively, I would just say uh, they have to do what they've done against the run, and they've been pretty good. they got a lot of bodies they can throw at you they can, uh, to stay fresh and healthy there and everything. They've just been, they've been really salty. It's been a hallmark of – Michigan State for several years going through multiple coaches, and so they have to keep that up, I would say, uh, on that. And the other thing is, of course, they want to they want to limit the explosives. That's something they did a pretty good job with Ohio State. I mean, Ohio State had to go like 12 plays, 70, 80 yards a couple times for scores, you know. So if you're making them just take little bites all the way down the field as opposed to 
you know, snatching it all in one play, uh, that's going to be what they want to do. Now, of course, that's easier said than done. Well, I, I'm curious from the fan base perspective what this one means to them. Obviously, you've already said you'll be making it your way out here for the first time. Is this a game you expect a lot of travel from the Spartan fan base? Is this a game that this game and this venue does it, you think excite the fan base? I'm just curious and kind of what the vibes are right now. Um, because they've played so recently, I don't think there's as much juice as there would be normally. You know, I, you know they were just out there a decade ago and they played two other times since then. So it's not like, wow, Oregon's this, this whole new experience. Um, I'm sure there will be some travel, especially because it's the only West Coast one this year. There's no USC, no UCLA, no Washington. They did show up at pretty well at Washington a couple of years ago. Um, I don't think I haven't heard this big drumbeat of people going out there. I'm sure the West Coast, it's a huge school, um, right. Michigan State, you know, 50,000 students. Uh, so there's alumni everywhere. I'm sure there will be a contingent just because there always is you know, pretty much anywhere you go in the country. But um, I haven't heard about you know a lot of this big groundswell to get out there. And I don't know, again, just because the programs have played each other or the Friday night aspect of it or people just think they're going to get smashed. I don't know necessarily what that is. I, you know, they, I think the fan base, when you ask about like the vibes like this week, most people, I think, came out of that Ohio State game pretty encouraged. Again, I know the final score is what it is, and you can have, you know, debate about moral victory or this or that, but like they played them for a half, at least as close as they have uh, in quite a long time, definitely since Mark Antonio was here. So I think. That showed. I mean, if they could get into the red zone four times against Ohio State, I don't think a lot of people thought that was they were capable of that. And so, if a couple things go differently there, you're in a much different game at halftime. Who knows? We'll go. I'm not saying they would have or even should have won it, but I think that 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 a lot of people came away from that game encouraged. And now they're like, okay, we're not just going to go out to uh, Hobson and, and lay down. Like, let's go give a, another good team our best shot and see what that looks like. But nobody. Uh, with any sense to pick them to win this game or the last game in the preseason, everybody thought. So it's these two, then they have Iowa, then they have Michigan. It was these four games that were in the middle of the schedule that everybody thought would really be a gauntlet. And I wouldn't even want to say determine their season because most people thought they would go 0-4 or 1-3, and and we'll see how that goes now. Um, but this was always like the daunting part of the schedule. Oregon was never in the calculation as like that's that's a winnable game or that's a game they could sneak up and get them. That was never it at all. I think it's just like Ohio State last week. Like, you showed pretty well. You did some encouraging things. Let's see that again, right? Let's see the the focus, the confidence, the belief, all that type of stuff against a big-time opponent and just measure up. You know, this, this whole season is really a learning experience for everybody, coaches, fans, media, whatever. Um, and so this is going to be another opportunity to see exactly how they stack up because they did give Ohio State a, a decent scare there for a little bit. Steven, thanks for coming on the show. Really appreciate the time and uh, safe travels west. And uh, we look forward to, to shaking hands and, and talking to the press box pregame. Absolutely, guys. Thanks so much for having me on. I'm really excited to get out there. I, I am. I don't know if the whole fan base is coming out with me, but <laughs> I'm definitely excited to get out there and see that environment. Um, open air press box real quick before I go. Yep. Or, yeah, or not. yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Open air. I did not know that before I went to Husky Stadium a couple years ago, and it got a little nippy in the. <laughs> We'll pack accordingly. I'm glad. I, I'm glad I remember to ask that. I, yeah, I bring it's, a, uh, it, it's, a light, light jacket, light jacket kind of evening. I think. Yeah. Okay. Great. Great. Good to know. All right, man. Well, thanks again, and uh, look forward to, to talking with you down the road. Definitely. Thanks, guys.